Good morning. My name is Barb, and I would like to welcome you to Covenant Community Fellowship. It's great to have you with us this morning. If you are new, please fill out our digital connection card and let us know how we can stay in touch with you. After a few announcements, we will have a time of worship and a message by Pastor Kevin. Please feel free to participate in the chat during the service. And if you haven't done so already, please say hello to those who are watching with you this morning. Today is the official turn-in day for Operation Christmas Child. If you would like to bring your boxes to the church, the church building will be open today from 11 till noon. If you need someone to pick your box up, let us know and we will make arrangements for that to happen. On behalf of all the pastors at CCF, I would like to thank you for your generosity and your encouragement during Pastor Appreciation Month. We appreciate you and we are so glad to be part of this congregation. We have several birthdays this week. Happy birthday today to Joe Cook and happy birthday the 16th to Jack Fouts. Happy birthday on the 18th to Kathy Willis and Kelly Warner and happy birthday to James Large and James Mayberry on the 19th. We appreciate your continued generous giving we are able to meet our expenses and to support our missionaries because of your faithfulness. Thank you so much. Remember that you can give online at our website, ccfcanton.org, or by mailing a check to the building at 2075 North Main. Our mission's emphasis this week is LRM. They are located in Litchfield, Illinois, but they minister not only locally, but also around the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your generosity toward us and we thank you for your provision. We thank you that you've given us the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of your son and the salvation that he brings. We ask that today, as we listen to the message, that you will touch our ears and help us to absorb the truth that you have for us. We bless you and we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy the rest of the service today. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing some songs in worship now. And I just want to encourage you, if you know these songs, to sing along. The words will be on the screen. And let's just pray. And Father, I thank you for um, today and, Lord, for uh, these people. And I pray that you would just give us all a sense of your nearness, Lord, and help us to feel connected to one another, although we aren't together in the same building. We know that you connect us all. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
Show us more of who you are. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I've been having some uh, thoughts about love and love in action, and so I decided to, to start a little bit, maybe a, a, a series called Love is an Action Word. It's not just a noun. It's, it's not just a word that we use to describe ourselves or someone else, but really is a full action word, at least it should be. So I'm gonna say that love really is a verb. Uh, several things come to my mind and I will have you look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 here in a little bit. Uh, John talks about that. Uh, 50 some years ago, uh, last month or so, there was a great music group that took over the world. You'll know them, many of you will know them as the Beatles. And one of their top songs was All You Need Is Love. That was one of my favorite songs. In fact, there were a lot of those kinds of songs in my growing up in the 60s. Perhaps it was because there was a war going on that was very unpopular. The Vietnam War, and so many of the songwriters were expressing what people were longing for. Uh, that was the generation that had the reputation of being the love generation. And it seems like back then, most of the songs were being written and sang about love, but usually it was talking more about the act of making love, uh, not just the act of loving and, uh, and, and maybe making that an action word. Another thing came to my mind when I was thinking about that. Back in those years, there was a lot of emphasis on Sunday school classes. And one of the Sunday school classes that I remember was a Sunday school class called Love in Action. And that Sunday school class uh, showed a lot of love by supporting missionaries, serving them from far away, uh, or maybe even serving families across town that were poor, or maybe even doing what we're doing this last, what we did this last week by operating our uh, Operation Christmas Child by sending boxes around the world. <clears throat> but really what it was, was it was love in action. So I think it's appropriate in this day and age that we start realizing that love has to be more than just our words but it me, it's very appropriate that each one of us as Christians start realizing that we need to make sure love is an action word, something that we do. And so many of you have been a part of uh, seeing that we are now doing something online called CCF Online, and every day we're doing something. One of the things that we'll be doing on Thursdays is actually asking you, would you do something to make sure your love for Jesus is an action word. And so we'll be doing some things on Thursday that will be uh, demonstrating the love of Jesus. So we have to remember that while Jesus wants us to love him and love others, that we make sure that that love is not just in word only, but that word is in action. So in 1 John, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, it begins this way. By this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, 
let us love in word, let us not love, excuse me, in word or talk only, but in deed and in truth. So in a way, John's telling us that to show Christian love, it's more than just getting some good feelings when we read about God's love or even when we talk about God's love. It's more than just some good feelings, but it's, it's, it's something that happens that we realize we've got to put into action. We need to show it. So again, it's more than just a good feeling when we read about uh, love in God's word, but it's how we're supposed to demonstrate that love to one another. And in other words, it's more than just a general statement or getting a spiritual high as we talk about it, as we read about it, as we share about it. But really, it's more than that. So being a Christian is always a lot more than just reading about the love of Jesus or talking about the love of Jesus or even hearing about the love of Jesus. It's, it's more than just some cute quotes or cliches about love. It's more than just trying to sound holy about, oh yes, we love one another. And we're supposed to love one another. But, but being a true Christian is about who we are. It's about Jesus Christ in us. It's about Jesus Christ being allowed to work in our lives. It's about Jesus Christ being allowed to work through us by his presence being showed outwardly to other people that maybe don't know that love. So it's showing his love in action in everything we do and everything about us. That's because supposedly, and I mean this sincerely, when we accept Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be transformed, changed. Our relationship with him now should be guiding us. Our relationship with him should be guiding everything we do, and it should be guiding everyone that we come in contact with. So what does this loving in action, loving is an action word, what does that really mean? What's John really speaking about? Well, one thing is that uh, I, I, one thing I love about the word is that it never leaves us guessing what we're supposed to be doing. As Christians, we're supposed to live our lives according to the word, and so there really is no guesswork. And of course, the drawbacks to that is we have no excuse because the Bible tells us exactly what we're supposed to, supposed to be doing. So God gives us the details of what he really expects, probably because God knows that if he doesn't, uh, it will leave us to kind of ignore what we're supposed to be doing, and we'll just kind of act like, well, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So we have these three verses. In fact, uh, these three verses give us the example of how we're supposed to make love an active word or an action word. But it also uh, gives us an understanding of how we're supposed to do it, when we're supposed to do it, why we're supposed to do it. And so it's really important. Now, what I really understand is that there's a difference between liking and loving. So you cannot say that these words the words like and love can be interchangeable, okay? Uh, I, I'm not just saying I like someone. Believe it or not, uh, if I have to like everybody, I might be in trouble because, to be honest with you, I don't like everyone. Uh, so if I like, and if like and love are tied together then I probably wouldn't be a very good Christian because, um, like I said, I don't necessarily like everyone. And if you're honest, as you're watching this morning, you'd have to be honest with me and say that you don't necessarily like everyone either. This is because like liking someone means that you have to naturally be interested in them. That means you need to like most of their qualities. You need to like how they look. You need to like their 
behaviors. You need to like the way they talk. You need to like their attitudes. But the problem with like is that boils down to this. To like someone means that we have to be tied to them deeply. On the other hand, we have to understand that the word love means that it's not just this general emotional feeling, but the word that John is using here is the word agape, which means that we have an unconditional love for someone, and that really is only understood by the way that Jesus loves us. How do we love people unconditionally? Most of us love people conditionally. I will love you if you do this for me. I will love you if you act this certain way. So there's this term that Jesus uses, and when he uses the word love, he's basically talking about loving you with an unconditional love. I love you no matter what. And we find that in 1 John 4, the next chapter, the 8th verse that says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And that kind of love, agape, goes way beyond my intellect or my emotions. Now, it includes my intellect and my emotions, but it's deeper. Agape love overcomes all the obstacles and all the excuses that I can ever come up with that would cause me want to want to shun someone. It, it's beyond that. It helps me overcome uh, both the things I like or the things that I dislike about another person. It helps me instead to see them like God sees them. And, and that's where we have a real problem. We like people or we love people if they do what we want them to or if they behave like we want them to. A, a lot of Christians hang out with other people because they do and say and behave like we do. But, but that's not the kind of love Jesus is asking. Our love in action will require that we love people that don't act like us, that don't look like us, that don't behave like us. That means that it is God's love that has to be working through us. It has to be the love of Jesus that enables me to see a person as a human being as Jesus created them to be. And more importantly, it helps me to see that person as a man or a woman or a boy or a girl whom God himself loves so much that Jesus went to the cross for them. He did that in order to give that person the same opportunity just as God gave that opportunity to you and to me. So Jesus did that in order to give that person the opportunity to accept him, just as he gave us that opportunity to accept him. He died on the cross for that person, just as he died on the cross for you. So that's why it's important that love becomes an action word, that I will love people regardless of their lifestyle. I will, regard, I will love people regardless of their behaviors, okay? So what God did is he looked way beyond liking someone. That's why it says in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. So when we as Christians then love someone else, it means that we actually treat them as though we do like them, even though perhaps sometimes we don't. And fortunately, again, the Bible does not ask us or tell us to like the brethren, but the Bible says that we are to love the brethren. Again, we not, may not always like them, 
but because you love them, you go actually beyond liking them to loving them. Another issue that we have to deal with is the thing called then, who are my brothers? Who am I supposed to love? And and in that reference, is it a biological brother? I mean, is it my sibling? Well, it is, but it's, I have to say it's yes and no. To see actually what that word brother means, which is found in both the New and the Old Testament, and it usually refers to either a family member or to a person who in the Old Testament is a part of the tribe of Israel, it's actually the Greek word adelphos, which means the fellowship or the community of believers. So in this manner, Jesus is speaking what he says to the brethren. He's talking to a community of believers, or what we would even call church members, or koinonia, a fellowship of brothers and sisters, or fellow believers. And he's talking about us, those of us who gather together. And in that day, there was only one church, so it wasn't a denomination. There wasn't that. And in context, he's talking about that we're referring to those of us who gather together, brothers and sisters who love one another, who desire to advance the kingdom of God, to love one another, remembering how important it is that we care about one another. And it is really, it is inside the body of believers. So I want to talk about that a minute. We place a lot of emphasis on going outside the walls, and we're doing that. Don't misunderstand me. But I know that a lot of times that we think all of our humanitarian needs and all of our love and action has to be outside the walls. But really, there are a lot of needs with inside our church, the brothers and sisters, the elderly, the shut-ins. We're going to be talking about that that really need to be, be, be shown the love of Jesus, that we need to make sure that the love of Christ is active, that it's an action word. And I think the story of the Good Samaritan is really a good example of showing how we need to love everyone. Yeah, this teaching uh, specifically it, it, it is, is really showing the importance of loving one another as brothers. So if we can't or won't love fellow Christians, then how are we going to possibly love people who aren't Christians? Okay, so some Christians aren't really that lovable. I get it. But regardless, this loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is what verse 17 is talking about. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So it's really easy to come to church or life group or Bible study and listen to the word and and even have a study guide, even in the comfort of someone's home. It's easy to have a missions meeting to study about missionaries in the comfort of some nice room. But when we see a brother or sister in Christ in need, or when we see another human being in need, and we we look the other way and we close our hearts, how is all of our feel-good study going to help us at all? How can we even talk about love? How can we even talk about the love of Jesus if we know there's someone in need and we're not doing anything about that? How is that showing Jesus Christ to anybody? Again, I'm looking at the at this story of the Good Samaritan because I think it hits it. Here was this priest, or we'll say a pastor and elder, and he saw this guy who was, who was robbed and beaten, and he crossed over on the other side of the road to walk on by him. 
Maybe the priest or the pastor was in a hurry to get to an important meeting. Who knows? But the implication was that his heart was all wrong. And then next comes the Levite or a professional religious person. And he does the very same thing. He crosses over and walks on by. Maybe he had to go to work or maybe he was a church planner and he was on his way to to some important denominational meeting to get what he needed to do. And so he walked on by instead of helping the guy. It was a heart issue. And I want to say, I, I think that's what our problem is right now. I think that we're so busy doing church work. That's why last Thursday night, this past Thursday night, when 12, 13 of us came together to pack boxes for Operation Christian's Child, uh, you know, I, I went because, I well, we need to do this and it's a duty. But as I was packing and I started putting just, you know, little flashlights and toothbrushes, I'm thinking, I have a flashlight in every drawer and a toothbrush in every drawer. But these children, this is the only box they're probably going to get in their life. And, and they're going to treat this... Uh, uh, they're going to get a little stuffed toy that they've never had before, and, and, and we've got enough to throw away at our house. And I'm starting realizing this is love in action. This is taking time to do something that I could be doing something else, but this is important, okay? And, 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 and so in this story of the Good Samaritan, the people who should have known what it was to show love, they should have known love was an action word. They were so busy about their religious duties that they walked by the most important opportunity to show love. And so here comes this Samaritan. He was an outcast. His background wasn't right. He was a renegade. He was a half-breed, as the Jews would see him. Definitely not, definitely not liked at all by the Jews. And we know that he saw the man and he felt compassion and he did what was right. He didn't close his heart. He apparently had God's love abiding in him and he made love an action word. Paul gives us a great statement on love in the love passage in 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, this passage pretty much sums it all up and, and sums up what I'm trying to share with you. When we can go around making a lot of noise and we can think that speaking in tongues makes us more holy, but we're only like a clanging gong or a symbol that Paul speaks of. That's why Paul says, if I don't have love, that I'm nothing. Sure, people will notice. But like Paul went on to say, what good is it? What good is it? Instead, the greatest of all the gifts is love. Love in action. And when love is in action, then love is going to be patient. So let's show patience towards our brothers and our sisters in Christ and even those who aren't brothers and sisters in Christ. It goes on to say love is kind. So let's show kindness towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Love does not boast. It's not envious. Love isn't arrogant and rude. Oh my gosh. Christians can be so arrogant and rude. So let's show Jesus instead of an attitude. Love doesn't insist on its own way. In fact, it's not about you anyway. It's about Jesus. Love doesn't get irritable or resentful. So let's show love towards our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing it rejoices in the truth. And don't go and get all happy when a brother or sister in Christ whom you don't like goes and is wronged by someone else or suffers some kind of law because love bears all things, believes all things, 
hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends. Faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. Show the love of Christ in you to your church family. Show the love of Jesus in you to other Christians. Show the love of Jesus in you to the world. Put love into action because love is an action word. It's not just a word. It's an action word. So that's why I'm excited. I am so thankful for Paul and Roberta Reber and their heart for Operation Christmas Child. And it looks like we probably went over the top. I don't know how many boxes. I think we went over 144 boxes, 149 boxes. And it's because of you, because of them. It was understanding that love is an action word. And we're going to be doing that every Thursday. In fact, we are going to be every month doing something for shut-ins. We do stuff for college students. Uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to ask that every Thursday at noon, you on, on, on Facebook or on our uh, CCF online page, that you think of something at noon. What can I do by this evening that will put love in action? What can I do? What can I do for somebody? It could be a text message. It could be a card. It could be take a loaf of bread someplace. It's just something that will make sure that we're not just talking about the love of Jesus, but we're showing the love of Jesus. The world needs it. Especially after what we've just been through in an election, what we're going through through COVID. The world needs to see Jesus in action. You are his arms. You are his voice. You represent his healing power. People are waiting for you to show them his love through your life. God bless you. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make love an action word. So Father, we thank you this morning for your love your unconditional love. You love us no matter what. You love us regardless of our behaviors. You love us when we fail. You love us when we succeed. You love us when we're down and out. You love us when we're victorious. Now, Lord, would you teach us to love others that way too? Would you teach us how to walk in humility and meekness towards others? May people not see us as prideful, arrogant Christians, but may they see us as humble and meek and willing to even be weak so that through you, they could see the strength that you can give us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. Touch our lives this morning. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.